Hey, <laughs> how's everybody doing? Time Machine Teacher here, and we are going live to review for Unit 1. Hey there, guys. Good to see you. Make sure and drop in the comments. Let me know that you're here. Hey, are you ready for this review? Everybody got their review sheet ready to go? If not, I have put it in the links below in the description. Hey guys, scared for this test. Don't be scared, MR. We'll get you ready. Don't worry. There's Sarah and I see Dominique and Emma. How's it going? Good to have you guys here. All right, so if you don't have the review, the link is down below in the description. Grab that link so that you can follow along. Kind of how we're going to do this tonight, I'm going to start here in just a minute. And we're going to go over each set of questions. And then if you have questions about that that's not answered, you can drop it in the comments and we will take care of those as we go along. All right. Do you like my chalkboard? Isn't this great? So I got to tell you a little bit of a story about this chalkboard. This chalkboard was in my very first classroom when I was about six years old. So I have come full circle, y'all. <laughs> now I'm using it to teach you guys. Isn't that awesome? All right, yes, it is the 25 question review, I believe. Let me see how many questions. Uh, yes, 25 question review, and it starts with the question about the song Dynasty. That's the one that you need. Oh, okay, there we go. My camera blurred out there for a minute. All right, so can everybody hear me okay? Good volume? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. All right, let's get started. Uh, we're going to start on the first document. This is about the song. Well, your first question is, who are the song or who is the song? Okay, who are they? We know that they are a Chinese dynasty. So I would put that down for question number one. And they come after the Tang dynasty. You spell Tang like this. All right. Oh, is it backwards for you guys or is it forwards? That might be a little bit of an issue I didn't think about. <laughs> Hopefully it's forwards and not backwards for y'all. Anyway, Tang Dynasty. It is forwards? Sweet. All right, great. You can tell this is the one of the first slides that I have done. All right, so um, describe their dynasty. Can anybody tell me some things about their dynasty that is important? Let's see. I see Samuel's on here. Samuel, do you remember some things? I think you're the Samuel that's in my class, right? I think so. Uh, they had a bureaucracy so large that it was one of their weaknesses. Oh, how'd you know that? From the document? <laughs> Good job. That is true. That is true that they did have that. Can you tell me some things about the Song Dynasty that were not in the document? Anybody? 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 Gunpowder. Yes. Paper. Good. So innovations. The song are known for their innovations. Make sure and write that down. Innovations or inventions such as paper, gunpowder. Anything else? Porcelain. That's right. So you can write those down for question number two. Then we have question number three. It says, what is the meaning of the last sentence? So the last sentence says, by creating so many jobs and by paying these officials so handsomely, the song increased the cost of government to the point that they began drying up China's surplus wealth. There's a couple of key words in here. You need to pay attention to the fact that they created so many jobs and they were paying officials handsomely. What's that mean? That means that they were paying them a lot of money, okay? And so, because of this, the cost of the government increased and it was taking up the surplus wealth or the excess wealth, okay? So what's the meaning of the last sentence? You could simply say that the government was too large and they were spending too much money paying the people in government. Boom, you got that one, okay? Very good, and paid officials so much money that they eventually couldn't afford the officials. That's right. They couldn't afford their own government. Very good. Uh, let's see. Spent too much money on the in, from the government. <laughs> Inspirational Pop-Tart. I like that. I like that name. That's great. 
Okay, um, number four. What system was used to choose who was allowed to take part in the government? I'll give you a hint. We gave you an extra credit assignment where you took one of these. Anyone know? Anyone, anyone? Very good, Ethan, civil service exams. Boom, you got it. All right, several of you others know it too. So number four is civil service exams. Any other questions about that document that you have real quick? If not, we're gonna go on to the second one. That one was pretty simple. All right, let's go on to the second one. What was number three? Solomon wants to know number three. Solomon, number three just means that they created so many jobs in the government that, and they were paying them too much money. And so it was taking all the extra money out of China's, um, it was taking all the extra wealth from China's government. Basically, they're paying them too much. They don't have enough money to pay all of the bureaucrats that much. Okay. Yes, you can go back. That's right. And I will be posting this later um, as soon as we're done. So if you want to go back or if you want to listen to it tomorrow morning, you'll be able to do that. All right, let's go on to number five. Number five is the picture of the um, uh, mosque in the Umayyad Empire. First of all, you have to know the Umayyad Empire is when the Muslims expanded all the way into Spain. All right, and they're building these in Spain. And the question is, how did the architecture change and what was it influenced by? Well, the first thing that you need to know is that it takes on more of a Muslim, Muslim characteristics. All right, so it's a mixture of Muslim architecture influenced by Rome. How do we know it's influenced by Rome? Two key factors here. Look at the arches as well as the pillars. Both of those are very Roman-esque type architecture. Okay? All right. Any questions? Let me check. All right. Everybody good? So this picture, anytime you see this, anytime you see the striped arches, you know it's Muslim Roman inspiration in Umayyad Empire, Spain. Okay, you will probably see this picture again because AP test likes to ask about it. All right, let's go on to number six. Number six is the prime, or the document about the caliphates. And the question that you're looking for is what does it mean when the author says this common Arabic language bureaucratic culture was a major source of unity? That's the very first sentence. Okay, so let's look at it and let's look at your context clues to see if you can figure out what that sentence means. So here we go. It says this common Arabic language, bureaucratic culture was a major source of unity. So we have that word bureaucratic again. We know that means government. All right. So it's a common Arabic language as well as the government culture, right? So there, all of that is bringing unity. This unity was expressed at a formal level by the recognition of the theory of the caliphate. The theory of the caliphate. Well, who are the caliphate? The caliphate is the government or the leadership of the Muslim empires, okay? The ideal of the caliphate lived on after the demise of its political authority. What is the ideal of the caliphate? That just basically means like the idea of his power and of his authority, okay? And it, they're saying that it lived on after the demise of his pol political authority. All right. So demise just means like the fall. So basically, they're saying that the idea of this powerful caliphate is going to continue to live on, even though he really has not much authority. OK. Among the other dynasties, there were none who did not acknowledge the rights of the caliphate in the Kabuda. The Friday sermon in which political allegiances were made public. Now, one thing I want you to notice here, underline the word kabuda, because you have a question later that asks you what that means. OK, and if you look, it tells you what it means right after the word. So see that comma right after the comma, it tells you the definition. The definition is the Friday sermon in which political allegiances are made public. All right. So anytime that you're reading these documents, pay attention to that and see if the definition is right after the word, because if it is, then you automatically got that definition and you don't have to worry about looking for context clues. 
Well, political allegiances is important. That means whoever they are aligned with politically, okay? Let's go on. But whatever the practical reservations, no dynasty dispended entirely with the idea of the caliphate or proclaimed an absolute independence. That's an important part too, okay? So it says, no dynasty dispended entirely with the idea of the caliphate. That means they didn't completely separate with that idea, all right? And they did not proclaim absolute independence. So they never asked to be completely independent of the caliphate. The grant of the title by the caliph remained a sign of political legitimacy and a sign that the recipient was now an accepted ruler. Okay, so what does it mean? This common Arabic language, bureaucratic culture was a major source of unity. Basically, that just means that because the Arabs were controlling the government and their culture and their language, that it was a unified area. So basically, all of the empire became unified under this Arabic language and government. Okay, that's number one. Or, sorry, number six. Then we have number seven. Who is the caliphate? Caliphate, the leaders of the Muslim empires or the Muslim government. Okay. That's too good. All right. Let's look at number eight. That says, what is the kabuda? We already know that. You underlined it in your passage. So you can just refer back to that. That's the Friday sermon where they declare their political allegiances. The last one is the most important one for the test. Number nine, what is the main idea of this part of the document? It says, but whatever the practical reservations, no dynasty dispended entirely with the idea of the caliphate or proclaimed an absolute independence. The grant of title by the caliph remained a sign of political legitimacy and a sign that the recipient was now the accepted ruler. Basically what that means is that we have the caliph, all right? He's at the top, but he really doesn't have very much political authority at this time. However, all the smaller regional governments still look to him with respect, all right? They're not really being ruled by him, but they still have respect for him. And it says that, let's see. It said that they did not dispend entirely with the idea of the caliphate. That means they didn't get rid of the caliphate altogether. And they didn't proclaim independence from him. Okay? So basically, he's kind of like a figurehead. And all these little governments uh, and the regional governments are kind of like underneath him. And they're still honoring him. But he doesn't really have the political power anymore. Everybody got that? Any questions about that? Looks like we're ready to move on. All right. Let's go. Uh, let's go on with number 10. This one is switching the gears a little bit and talking about uh, Asian cultures and um, Asian culture. Okay, so Dominique, what was the main idea? The main idea... If you want to know, just rewind that a little bit and you'll be able to hear me tell you that, okay? All right, um, I do read the comments. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Sister. However, I am trying to get through these as fast as possible. So if you have questions, save your question for like right after we're done with the document and I will go over it if you need me to clarify something. However, if you just need it repeated, just rewind the video a little bit. Okay, here we go with the next one. It says, Following the laws of nature, utilizing the earth to the best advantage according to the various qualities of the soil, restricting one's personal desires and enjoyment in order to support one's parents. This is philaity of the common people. So it is that from the son of heaven, the emperor to the commoners, if phileo piety is not pursued from beginning to end, disasters are sure to follow. So the first question, number 10, says what is phileo piety? Phileo piety just means respecting your elders, your ancestors, and your parents. All right? So we have ancestors, elders, and parents. Has anybody seen Milan? 
or I'm sorry, Mulan. She respects her ancestors, right? She's always uh, talking about that and talking to her ancestors. She respects her elders, her grandma, and her parents. That's why it was so hard for her to, um, that why it was so hard for her to like disrespect her father by going into the army. So think of her when you're thinking of phileo piety. Okay, so put down for number 10, respecting your elders, your ancestors, and your parents. Okay. And you are right. AP does go fast. You are not the slowest kid on the block. Trust me. AP goes super fast. It's a college course, but we are here to help you. That's why I've been doing these videos. I will continue to do them on a weekly basis to help you guys out. I'm also available after school, so come see me if you're really struggling. I will be there as well on Saturday for tutorials. So if you want to come on Saturday, that's usually when we do the weekly reading to help you out with that. Okay. AP does go fast. Trust me. I know. So number 11 says, according to the passage, what will cause disasters in the society? Look at the last sentence. It says in the very end, if phileo piety is not pursued from beginning to end, disasters are sure to follow. So what is going to cause disasters is if phileo piety is not followed. If people do not respect their ancestors, elders, and parents, put that one down for number 11. Uh, Tom, what's the AMSCO book say about it? I'd like to know how it's different. And what about Mulan? Mulan, I'm just using her as an example of phileo piety. Okay. Uh, it's like the female of a family. That part, That's true. That is true. The female of the family has the duty to be subordinate to the male. That part is true too. Um, so there are many different parts to phileo piety. This is just one of them. This is the part that you need uh, to know for this specific passage, but that part is true as well. Okay. If this is too fast for you, Emmeline, just pause it and rewind it a little bit. That's completely okay. I just want to uh, be able to get through all of these documents. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you, How to Build Credit TV. That's right, 121 people watching. That's so exciting. And definitely be sure to smash that thumbs up button. I appreciate it. That helps my channel out a lot. Okay, so moving on to number 12. We're rolling quite along. Okay, so this one is about Buddhism and Christianity. We got Buddhism became a major world religion during the same centuries as Christianity did. No single event in Buddhist history marked a turning point like the Edict of Milan in 313 or the decree of 380 that declared Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. Instead, drawn by the Chakvartian ideal, different Asian rulers made a series of individual decisions to support Buddhism. All right, some background information that you need to know. Number 12, define the Edict of Milan 313 and why is this important? Basically, the Edict of Milan made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. All right. Why is this important? Because this forces everyone to become a Christian in that area. Okay. Now, remember, Roman Empire is very large. It encompasses a lot of people that were not Christian at the time. Okay. So it's basically the government reinforcing that everybody needed to be Christian. So make sure and write that down for number 12. Also, in this passage, we see things about Christianity and Buddhism. So make yourself a little note. This one goes with the Edict of Milan. You can put that out to the side in your margin so that you remember that. Then the next one talks about the Chakravartian ideal. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. But basically, that means unity among Asian religions. So if you need to know that, question number 13 is unity uh, among Asian religions. Okay, basically that means that they're very similar, okay? If you are Buddhist or Confucian or 
uh, Hindu, a lot of the same philosophies kind of carry throughout. All right. And so basically what it's saying is because of this ideal, it was easy for people to switch from one to the other because they kind of already knew a little bit about um, each religion. OK, it was very similar. So what's the main idea of this passage? Well, it's basically pairing these two things. We have Christianity on this side that's kind of like the governments are forcing people to become Christian. And then over here, it talks about how Buddhism really never had that happen, right? There was never a time the Asian ruler said, you have to be Buddhist. In contrast, look at the last sentence. It says, different Asian rulers made a series of individual decisions to support Buddhism, okay? So the main idea here would be that for Christianity, it was sometimes, especially in the Roman Empire, declared that the whole empire would be Christian, okay? So that's the Christianity part. That was a turning point. This document is saying that there was a turning point in Christianity when it was forced upon people, okay? And then on the Buddhist part, on the Buddhist side, that one was not the same. Basically, that one, um, individual rulers supported it, and so people eventually would fall in line with it, all right? Because of that word, <laughs> Chakavartian, I think is how you say it, because all of these religions are similar. Okay, does everybody understand that one? Give me a thumbs up over there if you've got it. Let's see. What class is this? I go to Lamar. Marth, this is AP World History. Welcome. We'd love to have you. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. We're going to start doing these on a weekly basis so we can make sure that you're understanding everything. All right. So we were on number 14. We are going on to number 15. Number 15. All right. Here we go. Okay. This one is about Iban Batuta. How many of you guys remember him from your reading? I know he was in there. I remember some of my students talking about him. So one thing I want to tell you real quick about AP World is that sometimes there's so much information that we can't possibly get to it in class. So that's why your reading is super important. And if you need help with your reading, come to Saturday Tutorials. We can usually get it done in one Saturday Tutorial, and then you're done for the week. So make sure you come. I'll give you some hints on how to annotate it and notate things so that you can remember it. All right? All right, so here we go. Number 15 says, who is Iban Batuta? Well, that one you kind of have to know off the top of your head because it doesn't really talk about it much in the document, all right? Iban Batuta is an Islam, uh, I'm sorry, he is a Muslim traveler that goes throughout Northern Africa, into the Middle East, and even over to China. As he's on his journey, he keeps really awesome records and journals of what his journey is about, okay? So that's number 15. He is a Muslim traveler who goes on these travels at, throughout, um, throughout Northern Africa, into the Middle East, and on to China, okay? Now the next question, 16 says, explain his point of view. Remember, for point of view, you always wanna ask yourself, who is the author? What do they believe and why do they believe it? All right, so keep those questions in mind as we're looking at this document. He says, among the bad things which they do, their serving women, slave women, and little daughters appear naked before people, exposing their private parts. Women went naked into the presence of the Sultan and his own daughter went about naked. They show respect by placing dust on one's head. The griots or the storytellers poetic ritual is unpleasant as in the practice of eating animals that were not ritually slaughtered and of eating dogs and donkeys. Okay, so when you're writing the point of view for this, this is how I want you to write it. You're going to say his point of view. When you're writing an SAQ or a DBQ and then they're asked for point of view, just go ahead and say that's what you're writing about. Just in case the reader is tired, they might miss it. All right, so make sure you say it. So his point of view you're saying who the author is, um, is 
that he believes the practices of the North African people. We know they're North African because it says that in the little part right down here about the author. So the practices of North African people are wrong. Now, if you simply stop there, you will not get the point of view point. You have to go on and say why he believes that. So you have to go on and say he believes this because why? Why does he believe this? Okay. Think about that for a minute. What is his background? What is his religion? Because religion always affects our point of view. If you're a religious person, you're going to think of something differently than someone else. All right. Why does he think it? He thinks this because he is Muslim. So he's influenced by his religion, right? So you're going to say he think this because he is Muslim and his religion says that it's wrong, okay? Or his religion says that these are not the right practices. I don't have, I'm right out of room. I don't have any more room. So anyway, you're going to say he thinks this because he is Muslim and his religion says that these are not the right practices. All right. Any questions about that? Anytime you have to write a point of view, always ask yourself these three questions. Who is the author? What do they believe? And why do they believe it? The why part is always external. It's always outside of the author, okay? Not something that you can usually see in the document. It's usually, there's like little keys in that little excerpt about the author. You can look there and see, you know, what religion he is or what position he holds in government maybe. Because if you're rich, you're going to have a different point of view than the poor, right? If you're a woman, you're going to have a different point of view than a man, all right? All things like that. Okay, there are 20 questions on the test. That's your answer, Dominique. And do you need evidence for the why part? You don't really need evidence for the why part, but I would suggest explaining the why part a little bit. So like saying that he thinks this because he's Muslim and his religion doesn't approve of that, all right? So explaining why that is a part of why he believes it. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Moving on. Number 17 is pretty easy. This is just using your map skills. All right. So you're looking at the map and you're saying, where does Christianity spread? Well, it starts out in the Jerusalem area and it spreads outward east, uh, sorry, west um, over the Mediterranean into Europe, uh, all the way up to England. So you're just looking at that map. Also, pay attention to the key. The key spread of Christianity is those dark arrows. All right, so that's a pretty easy one. Yes, it is only multiple choice tomorrow. No SAQ. So lucky on that one. No SAQ. Okay, let's go on to the next document. Uh, next document. Okay. Uh, well, Jerusalem or Rome, kind of the same thing at this time period. But you can, if you look at the map, um, it would be like the Roman, it would be within the Roman Empire, but um, not Rome itself, okay? It wouldn't have started in Rome because Jesus would have been in the Holy Land area, and that's where it started. It does spread to Rome for sure. Okay. Yes, Dominique, Christianity spreads where the arrows go. That's right. So whatever question we'll ask you about this on the test, you just need to know how to read this map, basically. Okay? All right. Let's look at questions 18 and 19. This is about the similarities and differences between two forms of feudalism. All right? We talked about feudalism in Europe in class and... I don't think I talked about Japanese feudalism, but one of your teachers might have. So in Europe, this one is where we have the king and we have the nobles, the knights, and the serfs. Remember that? Okay, that's European feudalism. Japanese, you're going to have uh, a little bit different, but it's the basic, basically the same thing. 
It's just different names. All right. So let's look at this and see if we can pick out the similarities and differences. So how about uh, when you see a similarity, put an S beside it. And then when you see a difference, put a D beside it. Thank you, Miss Panta. I appreciate it. I think you're doing an awesome job. <laughs> All right. So here we go. The prime virtue in the Japanese feudal system, as in that of the Europe, was loyalty. All right, so we have a similarity already. I'm going to put similarities in the middle. Loyalty. Put an S beside that one. Because the whole system depended on bonds of personal loyalty. Of course, loyalty was the actuality, was in actuality the weakest link in both systems. And the medieval stories of both Japan and Europe are full of cases and turn quotes of traitorous betrayals. So did loyalty always work? No, not always. Sometimes people were traitors. Okay, that's what that's talking about. Then it says, in Europe, with its background of the Roman law, the Lord-Vassal relationship was seen as mutual and contractual. In other words, as legalistic. That's just saying that over here in Europe, it's based more on law, all right? The relationship between the serfs and the nobles is because the law says that you have to be there. You have to obey the nobles, okay? It's law. So that would be a difference because then in the next sentence it says, in Japan, the Chinese system has placed less emphasis on the law and more on morality. So over in Japan, they're more based on reality. Okay? And they're also influenced by the Chinese system, whereas Europe is influenced by the Roman system. Okay, Remember, in China, we have Confucian. Confucian beliefs are very much about morality and relationships, right? So that probably has something to do with that as well. Then it says, that is on the subordination of the law to the moral sense of the ruler since his right is to rule, was theoretically based on his superior wisdom and morality. All right, so that basically means that over here in Japan, the reason why they um, obeyed the ruler was because he was supposed to be wise and moral, okay? And that was their job, that was their morality to follow him. Hence, the Lord-Vassal relationship was seen as one of unlimited and absolute loyalty on the part of the vassal, not merely one of legal contract between the two. Vassal is the same as serf or peasant. It all means the same thing. There was no room for the development of the concept of political rights as what happened in the, ref the West. So basically what that last part is saying is that over here, because it was based more on the law, the serfs will eventually want political rights, all right? But over here, because it's based on morality, that never really happens in Japan, okay? Because they're just morally supposed to follow the leadership, okay? So we have similarity, loyalty, all right, both. And then we have the difference that Japan followed more because of morality, whereas Europe followed more because of the law. Everybody understand that? Morality basically means um, being a good person, doing what you're supposed to do. Um, yeah, that's basically what it is, doing what you're supposed to do, okay? So they followed morality, and they did this because they're supposed to do it, not because they have to do it by the law, okay? Um, vassals are the workers. Yes, that's right. They are the workers, <laughs> Who would win, Ziggs versus Garza? I don't know. I don't know. Miss Garza's pretty good, but she's not the time machine teacher. Don't tell her I said that now. Don't tell her. <laughs> I'm swearing you to silence. All right, so here we go. Uh, what's one thing we definitely need to remember for the test? This. This packet. You remember this and you understand these documents, you will do great on the test tomorrow. Okay? Fives, I believe, Dominique, the fiefs are vassals as well and the same as serfs, but I would have to look that up because I'm not positive. So come back to me on that one. You're right, Peter. The monarch goes out the land, usually to the nobles. All right. And then let me move over here. The knights protect the land and the nobles 
and the serfs are the ones who are going to predominantly pay the taxes. All right, so let's go on. Oh, Emmeline, don't you dare tell. Now, I'm swearing you to secrecy. What happens on this channel stays on this channel. Do you understand, Emmeline? <laughs> All right, here we go. We're almost done, guys. Oh, this one's a good one. All right, so we're on number 20. I am about to blow your mind. Are you ready? Here we go. Okay, so we have these three religions. All right, on number 20. We have Jewish, Christian, and Islam. All right, these three religions are called the Abrahamic religions. Now, make notes of this somewhere, either like on the bottom of your review sheet, wherever you've got room, make some notes about this. Because this is important. I'll tell you why it's important. Because it's still around today. Like problems from way, 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 way back are still haunting us today. And here's why. So here we get. Yes, Samuel, we did this in class. So Samuel already knows this. He could probably teach this lesson right here. Okay, so here we go. Uh, let's see. All right. So we have the three Abrahamic religions. All right. What are they? They are Islam. Jewish and Christian. And we have this guy named Abraham. Okay. Abraham is married to a lady named Sarah. And Sarah really wants to have a baby, but she can't have a baby. And God tells her, just be patient. You're going to have a baby. But Sarah is not patient. Mm -mm. She tells Abraham, go ahead and get somebody else pregnant so we can have a son. So he gets Hagar pregnant. She has a baby named Ishmael. Okay. Technically, Ishmael is Abraham's firstborn son. According to Islam, he is the firstborn son. Okay. But then Sarah has a baby. She names him Isaac. According to the Jews, Isaac is the firstborn son, okay? Now, here's the problem, or here's kind of what happens. Eventually, through Isaac's lineage, we will get Jesus. Jesus becomes the Savior for the Christians, or the Messiah. He is not, however, the Messiah that the Jews claim, okay? Over here, through Ishmael, eventually... Muhammad is born. Okay? He's the start of the Islamic religion. So according to Muslims, Ishmael is the chosen son. According to Jews, Isaac is, is the chosen son. And according to Christians, Isaac is also the chosen son because Jesus comes from him. Okay? Everybody following along? All right. Now, Muhammad... goes to Jerusalem to a place called the Dome of the Rock, okay? Now, at the time, it wasn't a dome yet. They hadn't built the actual Dome of the Rock yet. It was just a rock. On this rock, Muhammad ascends into heaven, okay, according to Islamic faith. So they eventually build this big dome around it, okay, and it becomes like a shrine. This is Islam over here. This is why Jerusalem, or one of the reasons why Jerusalem is so important. The problem, though, is that the Dome of the Rock sits right on top of the old Jewish temple. This part of the Jewish temple is called the Western Wall. This is where the Jews still go and pray today. You've probably seen pictures of it. And right on top of it sits the Dome of the Rock. Now, here's the problem that we're facing today. As we speak, the Jews want to rebuild the temple. What? Yes, they want to rebuild this temple. What are they going to have to do in order to do that? Get rid of the Dome of the Rock. What's going to happen if they get rid of the Dome of the Rock? World War III, because the Islamic people are not going to let that happen, right? When I was in Jerusalem in 2001... I know, long time ago. When I was there in 2001, they were already collecting things to rebuild the temple. Now, if this happens, it's going to be a bad day. 
okay, for all those involved. But basically, all of this started from this guy right here, okay? So now, let's look at your points of view. Your question is saying, explain what ties each religion to the Holy Land, okay? Jewish point of view is at the top. It says, according to tradition, all great historical events either took place or will take place in Jerusalem, beginning with the creation of the world, continuing through the building of the great temples, and eventually the coming of the Messiah and the resurrection of the dead. Okay, so what ties them to the Holy Land? Well, the fact that all of their historical events have taken place there, such as creation of the world, their temple, and the coming of the Messiah. Because once again, they don't believe that Messiah or that Jesus was the Messiah. Okay, so the Messiah is still to come. So that's the Jewish point of view. Why do they believe this? Because remember, for point of view, we always have to write why they believe it. For the Jews, their point of view is based on their religious scripture called the Torah. All right. Christian point of view. Let's go on. It says for the Christians, Jerusalem was equal to God's presence on earth through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus' crucifixion and suffering at the hand of the Romans was seen as the abandonment of mankind by God. While Jerusalem was seen as the city abandoned by God, it also became the location of God's salvation and mercy on earth. So for Christians, the importance is because that's where Jesus was crucified and that's where he performed a lot of his miracles. Their point of view is based on their holy book, the Bible. Okay? Everybody with me so far? Give me a thumbs up. Yep. Okay. Good. Yes. Torah is kind of like the Jewish Bible or the Jewish like holy word, holy scriptures. Okay? The holy book. All right. Then Islam's point of view. Jerusalem was the first kilba or direction of prayer. When the prophet Muhammad and his followers first lived in Mecca, Following his migration to Medina in 622 AD, all Muslims prayed facing towards Jerusalem. Jerusalem also played a crucial role in Muhammad's ascension to heaven. That's where the Dome of the Rock would be and where he encountered God directly. So for Islam, the importance of Jerusalem would be that Muhammad was there. That's where he ascended to heaven. So you can write the Dome of the Rock. That's where he ascended to heaven. That's what's there now. And they base their point of view on the Quran. Okay. Any questions about that? All right. Dominique, why the thumbs down? What's so, what's so sad about this? Uh, do you have more questions? Let me know. Okay. We're almost done, guys. Are you excited? You are rolling right along. Hey, you know what, Samuel? It's okay if you don't believe in any religion. Maybe once you've learned them, you'll figure one out that you want to believe in. Who knows? And if not, at least you're an educated person and you can have an educated conversation. That's the importance of all of this because you don't want to be uneducated. It's true. Okay, the next one, number 21. Um, this one we kind of already talked about. This passage got on the review sheets twice. So basically it's that one that's talking about the uh, commonality and the common unity under the caliphate. So you can skip that one because we already talked about it. Now, the next one, okay, um, the next one, what about, oh, sorry, Dominique, I just saw your question. What about Christians did you want me to explain? Uh, just let me know. Okay. Okay. Here we go. So this next passage, I just wanted you to know the context behind this passage. Because if you don't know the context, it's kind of hard to understand. So read that context first. It says, during the time of the Umayyad Caliphate, when the Muslims were in Spain, they had large libraries. While there, Muslim scholars would help Christian scholars translate scientific information and philosophy for the betterment of the people. So this document is basically a record of that happening. Okay, Basically, Muslims and Christians working together to translate documents and get the education out there. Because at the time, there weren't very many people that were educated as a whole unless you were wealthy. All right. So here it says, our translation proceeded in the following way. 
Abraham Dodd, a Jewish scholar born in Muslim Spain, took the text and read aloud the Arabic words one at a time, while Archdeacon Domingo, a Christian scholar, wrote down the Latin equivalent of each word, of each of these words as he heard them. Okay, so basically they're just translating those documents together. So for that document, all you need to know is what's going on. Okay? <clears throat> the door price giveaway, huh? <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you missed it. All right. Maybe next time. <laughs> I might have to do a door prize when I get 1,000 subscribers. I don't know. We'll see. All right. Let's go on to number 22. 22 is about the Bantu people. I know this was in your reading. We didn't talk about it in class, in my class at least, but the Bantu are important. All right, so who are the Bantu? The Bantu would be Africans who moved from this area right here, and they migrated to southern parts of Africa. All right, that's who they are. Why are they important? Well, as they spread, they spread new crops and also their culture to other parts of Africa. So they're enriching the lives of other people in Africa, by taking their crops as well as their culture. And eventually that's gonna kind of dig into the new areas of Africa as well and mix in with the cultures in the Southern area. Okay. All right, let's go on with number 24. This is our last two questions. All right, this document is about Mansa Musa. He's such a cool character. It says the legend of Mansa Musa's wealth was recorded in maps particularly the Catalan Atlas of seven, or 1375, which showed an African ruler enthroned like a European monarch with a crown on his head and an orb and scepter in his hand. Timbuktu was once the center of religion, culture, and learning, as well as a commercial crossroads on the Trans-Saharan caravan route. Situated at the strategic point where the Sahara touches on the River Niger, it was the gateway for African goods bound for the merchants of the Mediterranean the courts of Europe, and the larger Islamic world. It was involved in thriving commerce in gold, salt, and slaves. So question number 24 is what is the Trans-Saharan trade route? We're going to get into this a lot more in the next unit, but basically it is a trade route that goes throughout northern Africa into the Sahara Desert. That's why it's called Trans-Saharan. And then eventually connects with uh, ports in the Mediterranean to take things over towards the Middle East. Okay, and then the last one is what enables Man Mansa Musa to be so successful? Well, if you look at this passage, it talks about how Timbuktu is the center for religion, culture, and learning, and how it's like right in that trade route. Okay, basically what makes him so successful is that he is the king of that area, and he's able to make money off of the trade route. Okay, and you can kind of get that from the document. All right, let's see if we got any questions. What about the culture of the band who is important? Um, hmm, let me think. Uh, I would say um, parts of their religion, I think that they spread. I would have to look that one up, Tom, just to make sure that I'm not telling you wrong. So check back with me tomorrow and I will tell you. Uh, but basically what you need to know for the test is that it's just important because it spreads their culture and the foods into Southern Africa. All right. Yes. New crops. Yes, Tom, you're right. Okay. And the trade route, which trade route are you talking to the, about the Trans-Saharan? If you're talking about the Trans-Saharan, that would have went into Northern Africa uh, into the Sahara Desert, and then connected it with Mediterranean as well as um, the Middle East. Okay, on the test, you have 20 questions. I think it's 20 uh, questions. They're all multiple choice. All of the documents that we went over tonight will be on the test. So basically, if you understand these documents, you will do great on this test. And as far as the spread of Christianity, you basically just need to know how to read this map and that it basically spreads um, from the Holy Land area over to uh, Europe, to the west, all the way up to England, 
through the Mediterranean. So basically just by looking at this map, you can kind of tell what you're going to need to know about that question. And Dominique, you want me to go over 21 again? Where's number 21? What's that about? Oh, number 21. Oh, number 21 is the one that um, we went over already. That would be number, it's similar. Sorry. Somehow it got on the review sheet twice. Sorry about that. I didn't think that it was on there. It is the one that we talked about, uh, number nine. So basically talking about how the caliphate really didn't have any real power anymore, but yet regional governments were still following and still respecting him as a political figurehead. That's basically what that one was about. Okay, Bantu, Emma, are the people in Africa who migrated and spread their culture. Thank you, Tom, for getting to Emma with that one. That's great. Thanks for helping each other out. You guys are awesome. I just love you guys. You're the best. Uh, feudal system. Why was the feudal system necessary during the Middle Ages? That's a good question. The biggest reason that it was necessary was for protection because the when the fall of Rome happened, it kind of, like the whole government just basically crumbled and people didn't have any kinds of forms of protection. And so leaders would rise up call themselves kings, and then they would be responsible for protecting an area. Remember, uh, we have the feudal system, and that one is political. Political. In your reason, uh, your reading, you probably read about minoralism. Minoralism? I think that's how you spell it. Um, that is the economic system. OK, and that is where people would live on the nobles manors and they would have little villages that were pretty much, um, you know, had everything that you needed. You didn't really need to leave the manor. OK, this was also for safety purposes. Uh, but remember, um, when the when the Rome first fell, there were a lot of barbarians that were coming in like the Vikings and people needed protection. So the feudal system kind of offered that. So, yes, you need to know this packet for the test. Every document that's in it will be on the test. As long as you understand these documents, you will be able to understand the questions that are asked about them. Okay, number nine, you don't get. Let's go back to number nine and look at that one real quick. If I can find it on here. Number nine. And then I'll get to Mansa Musa one more time because Mansa Musa is just cool. He's a cool dude. I think he's the richest man that ever lived. I'm pretty sure. I have to check facts on that one, but I remember hearing that somewhere. All right, so number nine, basically what that's about is this document talks about the caliphate. The caliphate is the government of the Islamic empire, okay? And basically this document is saying that the caliphate has lost most of its power to all these like regional governments that were underneath it, okay? So here's the regional government. That means that there were uh, other people that were in charge of different sections in each region, okay? And basically it's saying that even though the caliphate had lost its power, these reg regional governments still respect him. So it says, um, no dynasty dispended entirely with the idea of the caliphate, and they, they did not proclaim an absolute independence. So they weren't completely independent from him. They didn't get rid of him, okay? But he didn't really have any real power. He, uh, it says that the grant of title by the caliph remained a sign of political legitimacy and a sign that the recipient was now an accepted ruler. So they accepted him, but they kind of, um, they, they didn't give all the government over to him. That's basically what that's saying, okay? Mansa Musa, he's the richest guy uh, on earth. And basically he took a Hajj because he is Muslim. Remember the Hajj is the journey to um, Mecca. And he took a Hajj there. And while he was going there, he basically went like this with his money. And he put so much money into the economies of the places that he was um, going through that it really um, it tanked some of their economies as a matter of fact, and then helped some out as well. So his story is pretty cool. There's some really cool YouTube videos on him. You'll have to check it out. Okay, let's see if there is any more 
This will be uploaded. I will definitely put it up there so that you can watch it later if you want. The test is not going to be exactly from the textbook, no, but all of these documents will be on it, okay? Lana, well, I don't want you to do the review on your own <laughs> because what's the use of the review if you don't have the right answers, right? Um, do you need to know the passage after question number 21? Yes, you need to know all the passages. These are all on here. But listen, these questions aren't exactly what's going to be on the test. These questions are to get you to think about the documents and get you to understand the documents, okay? So um, if you understand the documents, you'll be fine, Ethan, on that test tomorrow. And thank you, Team Mabel, uh, Vanilla. I appreciate that comment very much. I'm super tired today, but I want you guys to do well. So I'm really excited that you all showed up for this. Um, why was Manza Musa successful? He was successful because he lived very close to the Trans-Saharan trade route. He was able to make money off of that. Okay, number 23. Oh, let's see. If that's an easy one, I'll answer it again. Uh, number 23, they're important because they spread their culture and they spread their foods to other part of Africa. All right. Timbuktu had a flourishing trade economy. Yes. He was the king there. Yes. Uh, he's the king of the area who was able to make money off the trade route. Very good, Tom. Thank you so much. You are so welcome, Lady Nadia. Thank you for tuning in. I really appreciate you guys so much. Uh, what else we got? Let's just make sure that everybody's question is answered. 25. I put it somewhere up there. Let's see. Okay. Uh, what do we need to know from it? Ethan, what do you mean? What do you need to know from it? Basically, all of these documents. If you understand these documents, you're good to go. Uh, the purpose of the passage after 21 is to say that there was culture tolerance in Spain. Which one is that? Uh, yeah, you could talk about that as the purpose. Sure. Absolutely. I didn't ask you that question because I don't think that's the question on the test. But definitely um, culture tolerance and cultures working together. Okay. That's definitely important to note. Yes, Chris, I believe you will pass as long as you know these documents. Very much so. Ran, listen, I wish I could teach all of you too, but this is what's so cool about YouTube. I kind of get to be your teacher, right? And I'm going to start doing these on a weekly basis, probably either Monday or Tuesday. So make sure you click that notification bell so that you don't miss a thing. Yes, I have drank the YouTube juice. I'm saying just like the YouTubers do. <laughs> all right. And we can do our reading then. Uh, let's see what else it just says. Okay. I think I'm back. It said my connection was unstable for some reason. Okay. So any, uh, last minute questions, 24 hour live stream. <laughs> I don't think I could stay up for 24 hours, mister. Uh, just don't think I could. All right. Yes. And smash that like button. <laughs> All right. So one last thing I just want to tell you, I will start doing these on a weekly basis. It'll be either Monday or Tuesday at 7 p.m. So you can tune in. If we don't have a test that week, I'll probably just be going over what we talked about that week. or Maybe talk a little bit about what's in the reading in case you're not understanding that. I am there for Saturday tutorials. I'm also available after school in the learning commons until 4.15 on Monday through Thursday. So thank you so much for tuning in. If you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you subscribe, hit that notification bell so that you don't miss any upcoming lives. I really appreciate you guys. I hope you do well on the test. Make sure you stop by and let me know how you did. All right. Now don't stay up late studying because if you know these documents, you're good to go. So I will see you tomorrow and I wish you all the best of luck. All right. Signing off. Time Machine Teacher out of here. Talk to you next week.